beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Jesus, the very Son of God, left the splendor of heaven, came to earth, lived among us, taught us about his Father, and then did what was necessary to provide salvation for all those who believe in God. It's no wonder that when the host of angels announced Jesus' birth to the shepherds outside of Bethlehem, they began by saying, Glory to God in the highest. The coming of the Savior is the most wonderful and glorious thing which this world had yet seen. In 1715, Antonio Vivaldi chose the theme of glory as the opening for one of his most popular oratorios. The entire work has 12 sections and the theme of God's glory permeates in all 12 parts. As you listen to this arrangement of the opening chorus, consider the words from the Apostle John concerning the mission of Jesus Christ. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Zion Music, published in 1609. The original 20-plus stanzas 
focused on the events of Christ's birth as recorded in the Gospel of Luke 1-2, and in the second chapter of Matthew's Gospel. The image of a rose blooming out of season and out of place is derived from several passages in the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 11, 1 says, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Isaiah 35, 1 reads, The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. And Isaiah 53, 2 says, He shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of the dry ground. The picture of a beautiful rose flourishing in the midst of a harsh and hospitable environment became a popular image of the Messiah during the Middle Ages. Verses 4 and 5 highlight the blessings which are available to those who receive the Messiah. Verse 4 speaks of the salvation which the Messiah brings. This flower, whose fragrance tender with sweetness fills the air, dispels with glorious splendor in the darkness everywhere. True man, yet very God, from sin and death he saves us and enlightens every load. Verse 5 directs our thoughts to the eternal blessings which await those who know him. O Savior, child of Mary, who felt our human woe, O Savior, King of glory, who dosed our weakness know, bring us at last, we pray, to the bright courts of heaven and to thy endless day. Our arrangement attempts to reflect the simplicity, the beauty, and the joy of salvation. It begins with a simple melody, but as each ver new verse is introduced, the song grows in beauty and fulfillment until it climaxes and enjoys a powerful ending.
1720 by its author, Bernard de la Benoit, who lived in the eastern province of Burgundy. The lyrics focus on the birth of Jesus, and the song is sung from the perspective of shepherds playing homemade flutes and drums. These instruments were often used in this part of France as accompaniments for folk songs and carols because of their festive nature. The opening verse says, Billy, bring your new red drum. Robin, keep your fife and drum. Fife and drum together play, pat and pat a pan, Laura Laura lie. Fife and drum together play on this joyous holiday. The final verse draws on the union of the fife and the drum in making music to illustrate the coming of together God and mankind in salvation. While there is a lovely connection between instruments playing music, there is an even greater connection and a greater beauty between God and man when we are reconciled by faith in Jesus Christ. The final verse reads, God and man together today become one the two the fife and drum. Fife and drum together play, pat a pat a pan, throw a roar away. Fife and drum together play on this joyous holiday. Although this song was 
Well known and frequently recorded on various Christmas albums, it did not begin to appear in major handles for congregational use until 1980 when there was a renewed interest in African American spiritual traditions and heritage. The final verse, which is omitted from the most popular hymnals, is perhaps one of the most powerful, highlighting the importance of Jesus' birth for all who have lived in the 21st century. Listen to these words of invitation. Oh, that star still shines this Christmas day. Rise, O sinner, and follow. With an eye of faith, you can see its ray. Rise, O sinner, and follow. It will light your way through the fields of frost. Rise, O sinner, and follow. While at least to the staple, to the shining cross. Rise, O sinner, and follow. Little beacons of light and hope. 
Even though sinful man is still in rebellion against our Creator, God has provided forgiveness, peace, hope, and joy to all those who humble themselves and receive the Messiah.
uh, just a little bit more to play for you. But before we do that, I want to uh, encourage you with a little bit of scripture and some of the things that we have been uh, thinking about here at Branch Church this Advent season. We began uh, the first Sunday of Advent thinking about the glory of God as revealed in creation and how this entire universe gives testimony to the creativity and the wisdom and the power and the majesty and authority of Almighty God. We also talked on the second Sunday of Advent about the glory of God revealed in the Old Testament and how God dealt with sin, the transgression of Adam as he disobeyed and ate of that forbidden tree. And God, though he could certainly have brought Adam to an end right at that point, uh, in mercy and grace did not, and provided a sacrifice, not to take away Adam's sin, but to, to cover it, to make a way that there could be still fellowship between God and man, and all of that Old Testament sacrificial system and the prophets and so forth, all of them were pointing to the ultimate solution that God would provide for human sinfulness, and that is the coming of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And so this Sunday we're thinking about the glory of God revealed at his incarnation. That's kind of a fancy term, incarnation. We don't use it every day. But it means coming in flesh, that God took on human flesh, shared our experience, died in our place, rose from the dead to offer salvation to you and me. Let me just read a few portions of Scripture that sort of set that in our mind. The first is from John chapter 1, the Gospel. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. That word, word, is actually a title for the Messiah. We use words to communicate, and Jesus is the ultimate communication of God to man. And in verse 14 it says this, The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And then in verse 18, it says, gives the reason why Jesus came. It says, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. You and I could never figure out, even from the glory and splendor of creation, we could never figure out God. God had to reveal himself to mankind. And throughout the ages of the prophets in the Old Testament, he was revealing himself more and more through Moses at the burning bush, and later on as he was leading the nation of Israel out of Egyptian captivity. God is revealing more and more about himself. But ultimately, God chose to come to this world as a baby born in humble circumstances. Let me read from Luke chapter 2 beginning at verse 8. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. We often think of God as some celestial meanie up there, 
just watching and waiting for somebody to mess up down here so that he can blast them. That's not the God that's revealed in the pages of Scripture. Oh, he is a holy God. He is a just God, to be sure. And our transgressions deserve his judgment. But that's the glory of Christmas, because God sent into this world his own son, God himself. Oh, please don't ask me to describe and explain the mystery of the Trinity. I can't do it. But Scripture talks about it. And since God is a being who is far greater and far bigger and far more amazing and wonderful than me or you, I'm not surprised that we can't figure it all out. But what we do know is that God left heaven and came to this earth and was born as a baby in the most humble circumstances. And he grew, and he experienced life, and he was absolutely obedient to the Father in everything. And where Adam failed, Jesus did not fail. And where Adam, in his failure, became the head of a fallen race, Jesus, in his obedience, became the head of a forgiven, a redeemed people. That's all of us who put our faith and trust in him. God did for us what we could never, ever do for ourselves. Jesus on the cross took our penalty so that we who believe in him might go free. And there's even greater news, better news at Christmas time. Are you ready for it? John 3.16, probably the most well-known verse in the scriptures. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes on him should not perish but should have everlasting life. It's an open invitation, beloved. You come to God on his terms to be sure, but it's an open invitation to all people, of all nationalities, of all circumstances, of all time. Beloved, I hope that you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that you have a, a real reason to rejoice this Christmas season. But if you're here today and you've never come to that place where you've put your trust in Christ, where you've asked him to forgive you of your sin and to make you his child, today is the best day to do that. We don't know how long we might have to live. As Jim mentioned earlier, tragedy is all around us. All around us. And we have no guarantees, except the guarantees that God gives us in his word, that we who put our trust in him will be with him in glory forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your goodness to us, for this incredible demonstration of your love and your mercy. And Father, I pray that you will speak to each heart here today. For those that are believers, encourage them, strengthen them in their faith, help them to realize that they have nothing to fear in this life because they know you. And Father, for those who may not know you, I pray that today, in simple faith, they will cry out to you and say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Forgive me and make me your child. Because you will. You will do that. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your abundant grace. And we pray it all in your precious name. Amen.
beloved, we'd like to invite you to return and worship with us next Sunday at 10 o'clock. And then on Christmas Eve, we have a candlelight service with handbells and a brass ensemble and other special things. I uh, hope that you will be able to join us for that. And uh, I think you all maybe received some literature as you came in. So thank you for being here, and let's pray together. Father, we ask that as we go from this place, that your peace and your joy and the hope that Jesus Christ brings would rest upon each one of us. Thank you for your abundant blessings. Dismiss us now with your blessing, and may each one have safety as they travel home and a blessed, blessed Christmas holiday. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.